American Book Award and the Colorado Book Award. His most recent book, Ancestor of Fire, is shortlisted for the Reading the West Book Award. In addition, his novel, Rise, Do Not Be Afraid, was a finalist for the 2007 Colorado Book Award and El Premio Arzlan. Abeto was awarded a Colorado Council on the Arts Fellowship for Poetry, and he is a former poet laureate of Colorado's Western Slope, as named by the Karen Chamberlain Poetry Festival. Abeto is also a recipient of a Governor's Creative Leadership Award for 2017. Abeto was a finalist for Colorado Poet Laureate in 2019. Aaron has over 100 publications, including an introduction to poetry, 10th edition, literature and introduction to fiction, poetry and drama, 8th edition, Conversations in American Literature, Language, Rhetoric, and Culture, The Leopold Outlook, Colorado Central Magazine, The High Country News, and numerous other journals. Ah, Aaron. <laughs> Yes, how's it going? Yeah, all right. Um, I was watching the first presenter, and I was like, if I had to present with COVID, I would not have had anything near that amount of energy. You're welcome. But anyway, pretty amazing. But anyway, I'm really blessed to be here. I just wanted to say thank you to Rhonda and to Charlene and to the Atlanta Institute, but mostly to all y'all for being here. Muchas gracias. Wanted to shout out to my wife and daughter. Michelle and Drew, thank you for being here with me. Um, I don't know that my teenage daughter wanted to be here, but she's here, so I'm trying to ask this. And um, I was asked to speak about, about Dichos, and uh, you probably gathered from my introduction that I'm mostly known as a poet, as a writer, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of context how that transition is gonna happen, uh, or what it is that I believe, and how I think that the Dichos falls into that belief system. And ultimately, I believe the work of a writer is to save lives. And to save lives from oblivion, from the margins, from forgetting, to write about people and places that nobody else would consider beautiful. And to make those places and people and those things beautiful. And to find beauty where no one else would seek to look. And in my mind, that is exactly what these dichos do. And there's no way I can approach the hundreds and hundreds of dichos. There's probably more dichos in your collective memories than we could ever cover in a week-long conference, much less a 45-minute one uh, presentation, I should say. So if, if the goal is to save lives, if the goal is to capture things that nobody else would look for when they're seeking beauty, then I think the Vichos encapsulate that. I think they synthesize it. They bring it down to this distillation of thought, of memory, of beauty, of culture, but mostly of gente. And I, and I don't mean gente as in people, although that's probably the direct translation. I mean gente in the way that we treat one another, the way that we live amongst one another, la comunidad, the way that we help one another in a way which only raza, which only gente, which only comunidad can do. Um, I, I don't mean that as a, to cast dispersions on other cultures or other mindsets. I just mean that the world that I grew up in, si alguien necesitaba algo, there was always somebody there to go and help them with it. And everybody that I consider a hero was somebody who was always willing to sacrifice for someone else. And that's what I think these dichos kind of encapsulate. And I hope you think so too. We'll see if I can make that happen. I had a really beautiful font too, and this wasn't it. No sé qué pasó, it didn't translate. Uh, but just ignore the, the lame font and pretend it's pretty. Bueno. Um, so this quote is taken from one of my favorite poets, Yehuda Amakai, that which we will never see again, we must love forever. And I think you've heard this sort of 
theme echoing throughout the first two presentations. Chaoticus is stuck at the end, but we're losing little things here and there. We're losing bits and pieces of language. And one of the reasons that we're all around these tables today is because we believe in saving those things. We believe in saving Urdura. We believe in saving language. Because to save language is to save our media. It's to save memory. It's to save beauty. It's to save lives. And a friend of mine said once, if it's not written, it didn't happen. And I, I thought about that for uh, a good while. Because ultimately what, what it came to was, who decided to write these dichos down? They were always given to us in an oral tradition. They were always spoken from one person to the next. They were always carried in our memory. They were always carried in our hearts. They were this, uh, this way of holding our memories close to us, holding those that we loved close to us. And these dichos, not only for their wisdom, but for the person that conveyed them to us. And every time we hear that dicho, every time we hear that, that refrán, los refranes, we remember the person that gave it to us. It's a gift. But those gifts have been through loss of language, through assimilation, and you're gonna see in my presentation uh, some much more insidious forces. Those gifts have been diminished, if not totally stolen and taken from us. So I think it's important that we write them down. It's important that we have them, at least in this context where they are for the most part, stagnant because they are written. But if they are transferred to each and every one of you, if they become part of your dialect, if they become part of your collective memory, then they can live. And every time you speak them, they can have a life of their own. I hope that made a tiny bit of sense, right? So when I say that which we will never see again, we must love forever, it's that thing which is passing in front of us, that thing which is ghosting as it recedes. And it's our job to try and find it. It's our job to try and save it. And I think that they just are a good, 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 good roadmap for trying to do that. Maybe I should have just said great instead of saying good five times, but, um, but they are a great roadmap for having ways to save that. So um, these are some of those insidious forces, at least in my mind, where uh, I, think, I, I think that we run into the, a lot of trouble, at least in Antonito. And I'm specifically, just for a moment, I'm gonna talk about what I believe is the most detrimental thing to my comunidad, which is in the southern part of El Valle de San Luis and Antonito. And I can't tell you how much, uh, Dr. Ramirez, I was so glad that Antonito had a star and Sanford didn't. <laughs> just, that's a Sanford joke. If you're from Sanford, I'm sorry, I'm just teasing. Yeah, but, uh, but no, this idea of, uh, and you can see how it all got cut off. It looked much better in, in, when I had it in the, on my computer. But, uh, Los dichos, un pedacito de comida de, dejado por los antepasados. So that's the part that got cut off, right? It's a little piece of food that our ancestors have left for us. But when we're talking about surrogate colonialism, uh, I'm going to give you my definition of it. I don't think it, def it differs too much from the, from the book definition. But at least in my community, we've, taught, we've been taught to, to hate one another. We have been taught to oppress one another. We have been taught through these forces of colonialism and imperialism to, well, I'm going to use the word that we use all the time, partenere media, <laughs> to always, 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 and I, and, I, and I don't mean that to exaggerate, it just seems like it's part of our collective consciousness now. If somebody in our community succeeds, we always try and pull it. You, you, you've heard crabs in the bucket. It's not crabs in the bucket. It's, it's this notion of that success, that transcendence of that individual reminds me of everything that has been stolen from me, everything that has been taken from me. And in my pain, I am going to try and hurt them too. To me, that's surrogate colonialism. That's the way that we have been taught to essentially look at our neighbors and 
carry on the, the act of forgetting on behalf of forces that essentially have already done their work. They've already stolen the land, they've already stolen the water, they've already, and as you've heard numerous times today, done their best to beat the language out of us, right? And what's left in the wake of that is this surrogate colonialism, where loss replaces beauty. So it's our job to find in that place where no one would look, loss. To find in that place where no one would look the things that make who we are beautiful. And to me, those are those little pieces of food that our ancestors have left for us. Los pedacitos de comida. So I want to talk, because I'm a little bit of a nerd, I want to talk a little bit about the, the etymology of colonialism and imperialism. I'm not going to spend a ton of time with that. I promise I will get to the nichos. Um, but, so these are the, see, the N is not supposed to be on a line by itself. Right? <laughs> it looks so good last night, I swear. Um, but anyway, you can see the root words here or the etymolo etymological uh, roots of these words. And I wanted to just share with you what, what it is that they, what they mean, right? It means to farm, right? And I want us to consider ways that colonialism has raised this bitter crop. The way that colonialism has, as its fruit, created absence. As its fruit created complacency. As its fruit has left us with a crop of immediate, of disliking and essentially going after one another. That's been farmed in us. That's been irrigated. It's been planted. It's been nurtured and harvested. And it's been replanted and nurtured and harvested and re-irrigated over and over and over again, maybe for centuries now. But what's the goal of colonialism and imperialism? To command. To be able to do with us as they see fit. And I'm using those pronouns very, very specifically. Us, they. Who is they? I'll let you decide that for yourselves. But us is in the room. Us is here because you want to. Us is here because you understand what's at stake. I think the they varies from culture to culture, from town to town, from person to person. But the they is there. Does that make sense? So, how do we find our way out of being farmed? How do we find our way out of being lost around and commanded by forces that have no benevolence for us, have no desire to see us succeed. So this is actually one of my favorites. This is actually something my dad says all the time. And uh, I'll give you a, a little bit of context. So Masa Perdió en el Lubio, when I was a little boy, and this is something I say now too, it's something that every time I say it, I think of my dad, but I also think of the moment when she conveyed this particular saying to me. And uh, I grew up on a farm and a ranch. We still have a farm and a ranch. Um, and when I was a little boy, I think it was about six or seven, I, I don't remember how old I was, but I know that we had spent the entire spring planting barley. And, and my dad had, a, very reluctantly, because my dad is uh, an activist, but my uncles wanted to have a contract with Coors. And my dad didn't want to have a contract, of course, because the way that Coors treated Mexicanos back during the civil rights movement. But anyway, it was a partnership. My uncles went out. So we planted barley for Coors. And uh, of course, Coors rejected our barley. But we still had barley. Uh, and it was beautiful. It was tall, and it was thick, and it was all golden. This was, this was September. And it was so thick, the speed I was already kind of drooping towards, uh, towards the earth. It was one of the most beautiful crops I could ever remember. And if you, if you can imagine the Valle of the Sun, at least, and you can imagine all those mountains, all the storms, at least in our part of the world, they gather above the sun Juans. And that day, we could see the clouds gathering above the, the sun Juans, and they were moving east towards our fields. And by the time we got to our barley, uh, the hailstorm was so bad, it, it destroyed the entire crop. This was everything that we had worked for, for months. 
This was back then probably tens of thousands of dollars just for a translation, for translation for a for a inflation. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars today. And everybody was so sad. And my dad walks to the edge of the field and he goes, Mas se perdió el río. War was lost in the flood. So, what does that mean? How does this transition? Well, I have a few other teachers that I think fit in line with this. And I think they are these bits of food. They are these nuggets of wisdom that our ancestors have forced suffered for us. They have experienced losses that we have not even imagined yet. They have been through fires we have not walked through yet. But they know what it is to be on the margins. They know what it is to experience loss. So they hand us down these bits of food. They hand us down these things that will sustain us, that will keep us alive. So when the flood comes and takes everything away, we know that there are still better things out there. Ah, oh, come on. That just ruins it. Anyway, dog. I, I won't complain about my PowerPoint anymore. I swear it did not look this bad. That's the last time I will say that. This is this is the story of, of the same beach of two ways. Right? Uh, and this is the uh, the way that I think that most of us have maybe heard it. No hay mal que por bien no venga. No hay mal que por bien no venga. There is nothing bad that happens that does not lead to something good. And I think that's good words to live by. I think it actually echoes Masa Perdió el Lubio. I think they have similar themes. But as I was preparing for this, uh, we'll call it el speech. As, as I was preparing for this el speech, uh, I, I asked uh, my suegra and, and Michelle's uh, Godmother, right? Her madrina, to, to give me some dichos. Right? And this is the one that I think most of us have seen. No hay mal que por bien no venga. But you have to understand that these these two ancestors of, of, of Michelle's and therefore mine, uh, this is the way they conveyed it to me, and this is the way my suegra conveyed it to me. No hay bien que por mal no venga. Transpose those two. And I've actually heard her say this a lot, right? She, she says it very often. But there is no good which does not breed something bad. And, and I, I want to, and that sounds so negative. It sounds so pessimistic. And I, and I don't think it is. Uh, if you think it is, that's fine. But the way, I, the way I hear it is that we have tried so hard to fit in. We have tried so hard. The words were mentioned earlier, assimilation and acculturation. We have tried so hard to be American. We have tried so hard to live simultaneously in two worlds and be successful in two worlds simultaneously. It's exhausting. It is impossible, impossible, impossible sometimes to keep answering the question of where are you from? Because it's never asked with any sort of benevolence. It's never asked with kindness. It's always meant with your other, your different. You don't belong. So, to me, the first one is good words to live by. It's good food. It's important food. Let's look for the positive things that can come from all the difficulties in our lives. But the second one tells me something perhaps more profound, but different at least. Let's try. Let's not try so hard to fit in somewhere where we'll never fit in. Let's not try so hard to be good. Because to be good in a society that doesn't want you is essentially this, I don't want to say a waste of time, but that's, that's the phrase that's coming to mind. It's, it's not a way to to throw up your arms and quit. To me, it's a way of saying, 
Let's take care of one another. Let's be good to one another and not try and fit in in this larger context where perhaps we never belonged. At least that's the way I read it. And so we, we talked earlier, we, we listened as our, our esteemed speaker spoke uh, about this idea where different contexts, different meanings. Right? And that's what it means to me. It doesn't have to mean that to you. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about these dichos is that we interpret them on our own, in our own space, in our own ways, within our own context. And what they mean to us and how we adopt them is how the ancestors have left that food for us to survive. The nourishment is theirs. The life is ours. Con cuidado. Sabe más el diablo por ser viejo que por ser diablo. <laughs> so I don't know how many people need translation, but I'll do my best. Uh, the devil knows more because he's old than because he's the devil. Yeah. And to me, these are ancestors telling me to be careful. That imperialism and colonialism and the, and the wheels of hatred, and the wheels of exclusion, and the wheels of marginalization, and everything that drives us to the edges of, of belonging, that those things are very, very old. And that systems have been created for the express purpose of keeping that system in place. Systems have been created so that we as human beings, who have so much to contribute, so much beauty to offer, that it might not ever be recognized. So sabe más el diablo por ser viejo que por ser el diablo. Because I think people genuinely want to change. I believe that people know that certain systems are corrupt, that certain systems have been made to wound. I, pe I believe that this current world we're living in, despite what we see on the news, I think there are plenty of us, especially those in this room, that believe that there is plenty of good and beauty in the world and that we are capable of finding it. But that old devil always wants to. They have in time, they have in time. I want it, I want it, I want it. And, and we recognize that the system is old and it is our job to change it through the way we remember, through the way we speak, through the way we love, through the way we care for one another. More cuidado from the ancestors. El que ajeno se viste en la calle, lo desnude. If you dress as a stranger, they'll leave you naked in the street or they'll undress you in the street. Right? Who can we trust? Who's wearing all these false clothes? Who's wearing all these masks and costumes? Who pretends to love us? Right? But also telling us not to be phony. Also telling us not to be fake. Also telling us not to fall to that, that particular type of colonialism where we become our own oppressors. Right? Don't dress in the clothes of, of your oppressor. I'm telling you what they mean to me. It's just cool in its own right, right? El que ajeno se viste en la calle lo desnuda. If you dress as a stranger, then you will be made naked in the street. I'll let you decide what that means to you. I'll tell you what it means to me. And um, I'm going to cruise here a little bit because I know you people want to eat. Actually, I want to eat. Look at me. But uh, look, um, I think these dichos tell us how to be. They tell us how to belong, how to believe, and how to be where. Right? But they tell us how to be. So I'm going to share a few more of those. And these are all the ones that my uh, suegra and my tia, uh, through marriage, shared with me. There's, there's plenty of them out there, like I said, too many for us to, to probably track down. Oh, come on. This is the most famous one. Everybody knows this one. Now you can't read it. Uh, <laughs> Dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. See? See? I didn't even have to. We're good. We're good. 
¿Ya? Dime con quién andas y te diré quién eres. Tell me who you hang out with and I will tell you who you are. Be good, be better. Right? Don't hang around with people that are well, bad influences. Simple. So I want you to consider what are the bad influences that we don't even pay attention to? How can we decolonize our mind? How can we think of new ways of changing discourse, of shifting paradigms? Because that colonized mind goes with us from spot to spot, from place to place, from community to community. And dime con quien andas. And I think we need to think that one of the places, or one of the things that we uh, hang out with is that colonized mind, is that way of thinking which has essentially rendered us much weaker than we should ever even have um, considered, much less accepted. Perro que no ladra no muerde. Context, context. Those silent dogs are the worst sometimes, right? It was mas, uh, the, the meanest dogs are sometimes the same. But yeah, el perro que no ladra no muerde. The dog that doesn't howl doesn't bite. The dog that doesn't... See, that one touched the nerve. You can hear it in the room. It's like, not my dog. Not my neighbor's dog. But, uh, but it means what it means to each and every one of us. And I think that's the beauty of the dicho. That they are, in a way, uniform that they are in a way capable of being recorded and written down, but we each carry them in our heart in our own specific way. They are each attached to their own specific memory. They are each attached to their own individual life. This teacher could be your abuelita. This teacher could be your tia. This teacher could be a memory from when you were a child. And that's how it lives. That's this little pedacito de comida. But it's also telling us, this is what it means to me again, perro que no ladra no muerde, you need to speak up for yourself. And if people don't listen, then bite them in the ass. <laughs> or wherever the dog bites. Is that some that I don't think it is. Anyway, sorry. Is this being recorded? You can edit it, right? Ask <laughs> him. You know, I got this again. Just do good. And don't worry about who's watching. Don't worry about what the reward is or the pat on the back. Just do good. Do good. Do good. How hard is that? Kids on it. Not easy. Not easy. Because so much about surrogate colonialism tells us not to do good. It tells us to be jealous. It tells us to hurt one another. It tells us that we're not good enough. It makes us feel like we're imposters in a world which we have essentially made. How in the hell is that possible? Ask me in. You know I've got this again. These are going to seem a little bit paradoxical. Uh, again, to me they're not. Because this last one, talking about the perro que ladra and do good, essentially take action. But um, I'm thinking of this passage, and I'm going to have to paraphrase because I don't remember it exactly, but it's from Zoot Suit by Luis Valdez. And in Zoot Suit, uh, Henry Reina is talking to it, Pachuco, it's towards the end of the play. It's carnal. We learned a new way to fight. Right? And this is at the end, after Henry Reina has discovered that there are other ways of finding an identity, there are other ways of, of being able to essentially have your voice heard. 
And he's telling this to Pachuco, who earlier in the play, about midway through the play, has told him something which has always stuck with me. And, and I think it defined that first one, no hay bien que por el mal no venga. It, it was kind of in that same vein. And the Pachuco, when Henry and, and, and the Pachuco first meet, tells him, learn to wrap your loves, learn to bind your loves in hate, he said. Learn to bind your loves in hate. That's it. And my students, they, invariably that was a very difficult passage for them. And I, well, what does that mean? Why, why would you do that? And, and I said, if they think we hate it, they won't steal it. If they think it doesn't mean something to us, they won't come after it. So we disguise it. Those things which we love the most, we sometimes bind and hate. We sometimes put a force field of uh, apathy around it. Not because we want it to go away, but because we have so many valuable things which have already been taken. This is one way that we can perhaps defend it. And defend it through camouflage, if you will. Hacen más unos callados que otros quitando. So let's not again what they mean to me. You decide what they mean to you. Let's work silently. Let's not tell everyone what's most important to us. And I learned that lesson the hard way. Fairly recently. Right? By trusting people that I thought were my friends. By trusting people I thought were looking after my best interests. Who ultimately, not to sound arrogant, were actually just jealous of me and wanted me close so that, so that they could bite me, if you will. So, hacen más unos callados que otros gritando. So, I, I, you, you learn your lesson. You learn to work quietly because you can do more in your silence, in your motivation to be good and do good without always having to announce it to the world. Which is actually kind of biblical when you think about it. Segue. Dios aboga por el que calla. God advocates for the fallen. Which just means get back up. Get knocked down 99 times, get up 100. Agua que no te vayas a beber, dejar correr. If you have no intention of making a difference, then don't mess with that water, just let it run by. But if you better make a difference, then step on it. If you're not going to drink the water, then just let it run by. If you're not going to be good, if you're not going to do good, if you're not going to be better, if you're not going to change paradigms, if you're not going to announce yourself to the world as being beautiful and do the action necessary, then maybe leave that for others. Don't be a poser, basically. Again, what they mean to me. Everybody know what that means? Each monkey on his own swing. Cada llamo en su cumplio. Yeah, well, again, you're correcting me. You're correcting me. Chango to you, yango to me. Seriously. So I didn't change it. Because that's not the way I heard it. That's not the way I grew up with it. So I know that it's chango because I've heard other people say it, but that's not the way that my hymn says it. So why do they say it this way? I don't know. Maybe I have to do a deep dive. (laughs) 
lo que no te doy no te quito what I don't give you I can't take away I'll let that one stand on its own I got a few more and we have a few minutes before we have to get to lunch but um, I hope you see where I'm going with this I hope you understand before I become too repetitive that these little dichos are sabiduría de los antepasados they are wisdom and that that wisdom is universal but profoundly personal at the same time <laughs> that they are very very simple and deeply complex at the same time that they are easy to remember easy for us to live live our lives by if we become acquainted with them because they provide wisdom over and over again survival so do you give them comiendo yo a mis dientes que aguanten mis parientes This one came from Michelle's uh, Tia Virginia, who is actually one of the most brilliant people I've ever met in my life. She's, she's crazy, crazy, crazy brilliant. Uh, and she just had these, other, just one right after the next. Just one right after the next. But, uh, for those of you that need the translation, me eating my teeth so that my relatives can survive. Me doing with less so that we can all survive. <coughs> like my heroes, me sacrificing so that we can all advance. Del dicho a hecho a gran trecho. You might know this one as, do you walk the walk? Right? From saying it to doing it is a big, big leap. Claiming to be good and doing good, big, big, big. I love this one. <laughs> we were talking about Matanzas last night. And a cada puerco le llega su sábado. Every pig has his Saturday, but it's not a good thing. <laughs> Unless you like chicharrones, then it's good for us. Right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, but that, but all the suffering that our ancestors have gone through, all the suffering that everybody in this room has gone through, each individual story which makes this room as beautiful as it is, each and everything which brings us to this table and tables literally, right? It's, a lot of those things were painful. A lot of those things were hurtful. A lot of those things wounded us. But. Those things which hurt us, those things which sought to destroy us, cada puerto le llega su sábado. Again, what it means to me. These are just some of my favorites, which I'll close with. They have, they, these are my little food things. These are my, uh, these are the ones that are in my rotation that I didn't hear from my swagar from my uh, tia. And uh, I don't know. Hope you like them because I love them. And uh, I'll end with these, and I won't give them too much commentary. There is no bad bread if you're hungry. There is no bad meal if you're hungry. El con perro se acuesta, con garrapata se levanta. If you lay down with dogs, you're going to have. Well, garrapatas. <laughs> yeah. Y garrapata, gara todo, right? <laughs> es como el burro hablando de orejas. De orejas. It's about judging others, right? It's like the burro talking about ears. And uh, here's another one. Se me fueron las cabras. Y'all use that one? Yeah, I, I lose my cabras all the time. That's actually one of my, uh, it's 
one of my weaknesses, and it's not a good one, by the way. But yeah, I said, before las cabras, which means I lost my goats, which just basically means I got angry or went crazy. Estás loco o comiste lunes? Are you crazy or did you eat hot dogs? Ese huevo que eres sal. Let's have a good lunch. Thank you. wonderful speakers for you and so at this time we're going to take a lunch break so I invite you to get up move around grab some wonderful lunch